It's a time to be thankful, isn't it? It's a time to uh, be thankful this time of year as we begin to transition really into Thanksgiving and the Christmas as the year ends. I know we said a couple of weeks ago, but it's kind of crazy to think that this year is almost over with. We're thankful for our family. We're thankful for our friends, our homes, our jobs, our finances, our health, maybe even life itself. Hey, maybe even some of us are thankful for a state championship, right? Uh, isn't it crazy what God does? And so we're just finding ourselves being thankful, I hope, today, and I, I'm thankful that we have sang praises this morning that just remind us, God, you are good. Because if we really begin to just step back from the chaos of life, we are blessed beyond all measure. We have access to food and running water. We have shelter over our heads. We have freedoms to basically do whatever the world we want to within moral reason, right? We can, we can gather today. We can stand here unashamed and we don't have to feel threatened today. But why is that? James 1.17 says that every good and gift and every perfect gift is from above. So that God has blessed us. Psalms 107 says that, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. At His nature, He is good, and His steadfast love endures forever. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a God who loves us. We have a good, good Father. And we begin to think about our God, and we begin to think about what we believe. I think sometimes we forget that. I, I think we miss that our God cares about the little things, cares about us deeply and, and intimately for us. But if you begin to think about what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, he says, give thanks in all circumstances. So not just this time of the year, not just during the holiday season, but Paul seems to take it to an extreme and says, give thanks always. But then he kind of puts in the Jesus card, doesn't he? He says, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God is calling us to live a life of thankfulness, not just a specific time of year, not just reflecting on things. And I don't think that we're ungrateful people. I really don't believe that. But I, if I think about it in my own life, now, I don't think I'm an ungrateful person, but I also don't think about what I've been blessed with a whole lot. Uh, our lives are, are so chaotic. Our lives are so busy that we really just don't think about all the blessings that we have. Well, we expect our cars to crank up when we go to work. We expect money to be in the bank account when we swipe our debit card. Like That's just kind of the lifestyle that we live because we are blessed without regard, it seems like, in comparison to other places. Uh, but uh, it's just like we don't even think about it through life itself. The world is, is so full of hate and discontent right now that maybe even that has attributed to it a little bit. Maybe our lives are just so busy we don't think about it, or maybe it's just one of those things that we just don't see good in our lives at all. Uh, social media today leads us to believe that our lives can always be better, that we can always have a better version of ourselves, that we can always have else maybe we don't have or maybe we need to buy something that we can't afford or maybe just absolute bitterness and discouragement and brokenness is just a reality for some of us. 80% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. If you begin to think about it, there's about 12 million single parent homes in the United States where a single mom or a single dad are doing all they can do to make ends meet to be able to provide for them and their kids. A, a survey taken in June 2020 says that 14% of the people that took that poll, now however big that sample size was, I don't know, but 14% of Americans say that they are happy. And maybe that's where we find ourselves. Now, I'm not saying that that 14% is, is including, they didn't ask me if I was happy, you know what I mean? So I, I'm not included in that. But I think that's kind of a reality for us as a country and as a people right now. We're, we're beat up, we're exhausted, and we don't really think about what is at stake what we really have. Uh, today, as we begin to transition, and I don't want to start Christmas yet because we haven't got to Thanksgiving, but we have a God that can. We have a God that can do big things. We have a God that has done big things, and I, have, I believe that uh, we have a God that is going to do more big things. As long as God tarries His coming and waits on that glorious day, God is going to continue to do God-sized things in the lives of His people. He wants to do that. If you have a Bible, 2 Kings chapter 4 is where I want you to turn with me today. As we begin to look at this kind of exemplify, we see this play out uh, that a God, uh, that we serve a God who can provide, who can do big things, that can do more than we could ever imagine. And so today, as we reflect on that and we begin to turn our hearts to thankfulness, maybe you find yourself in that boat. Maybe you find yourself in the boat of, hey, this life's falling apart right now, but can I just ask you for this next four hours that you just lean into me, right? 
right? That for the next few moments that we have together, right? That you just lean in. As we've just pushed pause in the busyness of this week that comes ahead and in the busyness of what has been going on, that we just push pause and we can just say, God, would you just move? So if you're there, would you stand with me this morning as we begin reading in 2 Kings 4, beginning in verse 1. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take away my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, Go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her sons, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Let's pray. God, you are so good, and God, we are so thankful. God, how great you are. God, you have blessed us beyond all measure, and God, we just thank you for that. But God, also there's a a desperation that is a reality for maybe some folks in this room, but also for us maybe as a country, and also for, for people all around this globe. And God, today can we just rest in the fact that you can provide. God, that you can do God sized things. And that, God, you are still in the business of doing it. God, I just pray that you can use me today, God, but if not, get me out of the way that we see you in the fullness of your glory. God, meet us here. And it's in your name we pray. I love you. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So if you're in the habit of taking notes, number one, trust that he's able. Number one, trust that he's able. There's a widow, and she has a problem. She she comes to Elisha and cries, my husband is dead and I'm in a lot of debt and the bank has come to repossess everything that I have and that's still not going to be enough. So they're going to take my kids away, send them off and let them work off my debt. This was uh, typical in this Old Testament culture that if you were in a financial bind and you couldn't pay your debts back, that the creditor, the, the lender, the bank would come get your kids, you would send your kid off and they would work the debt off. They would come back home. So that may be a little different for us today, but that was the context of Scripture. This is what God put in place to be able to free you from debt that you have incurred, that you would be able to send your kids and they would be able to pay off your debt. But she cries to Elisha because she's in a desperate place. The word is a a desperate plea for help. Uh, The prophets in the Old Testament were a symbol of who? It was a symbol of God. So she's coming to the man of God. She's coming to God saying, I'm in a desperate place. But have you ever noticed that when we talk about people being in desperate places in our context, right? We see people all on the sides of the road with signs and we see the homeless shelters and we see all that stuff. We see these people in need. Have you ever noticed that our American context always says, y'all can do something about that? Come on, somebody. Our mind automatically goes to, you can get yourself out of this bind. I've made a name for myself. I've went and went to work, and I've got everything I've got. Why can't you go to work? Isn't that, y'all, come on. Y'all, y'all don't be too spiritual for me this morning, right? Y'all know y'all think that, and some of us do. But why is that? Maybe that's what we think about her. What did she do to get in this bind? Why can't she just go get a job? Why can't she just do this? In the New Testament context, most of the time when people find themselves in this bind, the church thought it's because you sinned. So because of your sin, this is kind of your punishment for being disobedient. Is that the case? I doubt it. Now, maybe it's because she was just foolish, and maybe she ran her credit card up, and as soon as she maxed out that one, she went and got another one, and she maxed out that one, so she went and got another one. She maxed out that and went and got another one. So she just accumulated all this debt. I doubt that as well. Because the Bible says that this was a wife of one of the sons of the prophets. Some commentators think that this was the wife of Obadiah. If you begin to think about that, now I don't know if that's the case, that's based on opinion, but just go with me here for a second and let's assume this is true. Y'all, y'all track with that? Y'all, y'all track with this opinion, right? Y'all, y'all, y'all good with that? Y'all, y'all help me out. 
Y'all ain't good with that, but that's okay. I'm going to do it anyway. But So this idea is that if you know about Obadiah, Obadiah was a, a part of the staff of Ahab. And Ahab was a very, very evil king because he was manipulated by his crazy wife Jezebel. And so if you begin to think about that and go back and play back that story, Jezebel hated God hated the prophets of God, and her mission was to kill every prophet of God. So Obadiah, being on the inside, took it upon himself to harbor, hide these prophets of God. So if she was Obadiah's wife, Obadiah is now dead, and so maybe, maybe just maybe, she tried to continue that ministry, and it was really, really hard for her to do without Obadiah being present. So in order to be able to keep everything together, she exhausted herself and exhausted everything that she had for this ministry and now she's left with nothing in return if that's the case then she obeyed God and this is what got her here come on you see it we always assume that it's something bad or somebody can take up and do whatever but we never really see the need why because we're too Americanized to see it Come on, somebody, you, you feel me? That why is she here? Uh, it doesn't really matter why she's here. It's not matter what she did. It's not if she accumulated debt. It doesn't even matter if she was the wife of Obadiah. The picture is she's in a desperate place. She's about to lose everything that she has, and she's about to possibly lose her kids for an extended, extended period of time. And she has absolutely nowhere else to go, so she goes to God. She says, Elisha, I need some help. I'm in a desperate place. I'm in at the bottom, and I need some help. I don't want to get rid of I, I, All I have is my house. I don't have a whole lot of food. I don't want to lose my kids. I need some help. The reality of the matter is sometimes good people find themselves in a bind, just like bad people find themselves in a bind. We can find ourselves in a desperate place. So she turns to God. But if you begin to think about it, it's normally only in times of desperations when we turn to God, isn't it? It's only in times of when we're at the rock bottom when we say, God, I need some help. But why, why is that? Why don't we not turn to God in any other circumstance? Or maybe, maybe we find ourselves, maybe like she was, and we start trying to figure it out, and then we end up digging ourselves in a bigger hole instead of just going to God at first. I begin to think back of... When I, I was a kid, right, and nobody ever stole from their mama and daddy, right? Well, I did. I, I didn't. I don't know if you'd call it stealing. I called it borrowing because I was, had intentions of paying it back. But every time I found some quarters or some change, I had a little box and I would get it. My dad had a big old tub in, on top of their dresser in their room, and I would go in there and I'd grab a handful every once in a while because I had something I wanted to buy, right? So I was saving up. Well, one day I got caught. Hey, full disclosure, y'all preacher's a thief, right? <laughs> but, I mean, come on, this is what I did. And in my head, it's like, ah, it's just, it doesn't really matter. But I, when I got caught, obviously the, my parents were a little disappointed. But I remember my dad saying plainly, why don't you just ask? Why don't why didn't you just ask? Like, what I wanted was childish, and what I wanted was, didn't really matter, and it was just a bunch of coins. It wasn't like it was a whole lot of money. But the point of the matter is, why didn't I just go to my parents and ask? Come on, you see it? Did I not think that my dad would give me the money? Did I not think that he could? Did I think they weren't financially capable? Or is that how we are with God? Do we not think that God's going to hear us? Do we think that God can't? Do we think that we have to figure it out? Come on, this is the way we live our lives. Is that we just get up and we go to work and we try to figure it out. Ask God later. Come on, somebody, you feel me? This is how we do life. When we find ourselves in a desperate place, we've got to bow up and we've got to try to figure it out. But God's just saying, hey, I'm right here. I'm a good father. I should be the first place you turn. Why? Well, he cares. God cares. 1 Peter 5, 7 says that you cast all your anxiety, all your worry, all your doubt on him because simply he cares for you. God is not a far-off 
absent figure in our lives. God is not absent from the intricate parts of our lives. God is a good, good Father, and He is involved in every aspect of our lives. We tend to think that God's absent. We tend to think that God's not around in those small moments, in those big moments, in those times of desperation. We've got a bullet. We've got to figure it out. But He cares about you. He cares about your hurt. He cares about your anxiety. He cares about your brokenness. He sees you in the desert place and he sees you in the valley moments of your life. That's what a good father does. All he's saying is ask. The same thing that my dad told me is, son, why didn't you just ask? That's the same thing God is asking his people is why don't you just ask? If you will turn from your wicked ways and call on my name, I will heal your land. That is a promise of God himself. It's not like it's just made up for thoughts. It's not like it just sounds good from the pulpit. That's a promise of God. So God is saying, hey, why don't you just ask because I care deeply about you. The second thing is he can. There is not a check that God cannot write. Come on, somebody. There is nothing that God cannot do. Jesus begins to expound on this idea in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, don't be anxious about your life. Don't be anxious about what you'll eat. Don't be anxious about what you'll wear. Don't be anxious about all this stuff. Don't even worry about where all of this is going to come from. If I can take care of the sparrow that flies around, that never goes hungry, that can provide for itself, if I can take care of the flower in the field, don't you think you who I created in my image, I can figure out how to take care of you? Come on. That's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. As he begins to say, look, I can take care of every little intricate part of creation. I can tell the sun when to rise and the moon when to come up. And I can make the moon reflect the sun's goodness. And I put the sun just far enough away from, from keeping you from freezing to death and far enough away to keep you from burning up. I can do that. So why in the world do you think that I can't manipulate and change things around in your life? If I have that much authority, if creation bows, you remember what Jesus says, if y'all shut up, the rocks are going to cry out. Come on. If, my, if I have that much authority over creation, then why in the world, my child, do you not think I have that much say-so in your life? He can. He is a God that can do more than we could ever ask or think. Trust that He's able. She says, I have no other place to turn to. I don't know where else to go, but here I am, God. I have nothing I'm coming to you because I'm trusting and I'm knowing that you are the only way to get me out of this bind. Number two, be faithful with what you have. Number two, be faithful with what you have. The first question that Elisha asks is, what do you have in the house? I would underline that. Isn't that interesting? She just said, I ain't got nothing. From a logical mindset, Elisha, were you listening? Did you not hear anything I just said? I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. I've got my kids here. I ain't got nothing. I got my house and... Oh, by the way, I've got some oil. But I don't really see where that matters, Elisha. He says, what you'll do, tell me what you have. And she said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. The question is, what do you have in the house? Maybe, maybe Elisha remembers what happened in 1 Kings chapter 17. Maybe the widow even remembers what happens in 1 Kings chapter 17. Elijah has been called out, not Elisha, Elijah has been called out by God to, to go to a town and you're going to meet a widow there. So he goes to this town and he sees this widow picking up sticks and he says, hey, bring me a glass of water. And so she goes to get him a glass of water. And Elijah says, oh, by the way, while you're going to get a glass of water, when you go inside, make me a piece of cornbread. Make me a little piece of bread. She stops in her tracks, turns to Elijah and says, bro, I ain't got nothing. I have enough flour and enough oil that I'm about to go cook my last meal. That's actually what I'm doing right now. I'm gathering sticks enough to build a fire so I can cook me and my kid a last meal so we can eat and we can die. And Elijah says... Don't worry about it. Go make me, make me some cornbread. And oh, by the way, that jar of oil and that little jar of flour is going to last you through the famine. And over and over and over again, that jar kept filling back up. Both of them did. Over and over and over again, they kept filling back up. She didn't have anything, but what she had, she surrendered to in obedience to God. You see it? 
Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 5, one of them, I can't, I just went blank where it is, but somewhere in the marks in that range is where the feeding of the 5,000 takes place. I should know that, I didn't write it down and I don't remember it, so I'm sorry. But Mark is where the feeding of the 5,000 takes place. You remember what Jesus said? Obviously they don't know this story happened, but we do. So you remember what Jesus says to the disciples? They start griping because ain't nobody got no food and Jesus looks at them and says, well, what do y'all have? Are you crazy? Jesus says, go find something. So this little boy has five loaves and two fish. See, I remember that part. He has five loaves and two fish, and that's all he had. And because of those five loaves and two fish, we have a miracle that is still preached about in churches all across this world over and over again about how God can take a little bit in obedience and make it much. You see it? What do you have in the house? See, Jesus and God are not worried about us being capable of providing for ourselves. He's just willing and wanting us to be available to watch him move. Come on, you see it? Well, we begin to think about capability, and we begin to think about what we have, and we begin to think about what we can and cannot do. Whatever we have, whatever that may be, whether you find yourself in the desert place or the high place, wherever you find yourself in life, this Thanksgiving season, whatever you have is enough. We want to be worried about what we have. Is it good enough? Will it be accepted? God just says, surrender to me and watch me move. If you begin to think about it in the New Testament, when God calls the disciples, you remember what every, all the scribes said? They begin to teach with authority and do great things. Isn't this the fishermen? They're uneducated. They stink. They're nasty. They're just, they just fish all the time. How do they know all of these truths about God's Word? They said the same thing about Jesus. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Doesn't he come from nothing? How does he teach with such authority? How does he do these things? It's about availability. It's about us being available with what we have. I begin to talk and I begin to lead uh, as, at work sometimes. We begin to get stressed out because we get worried about all the other stuff going on. We begin to worry about, well, this person's not here. Or we've got to get this done and we've got to make sure we get all this stuff over here. And I just simply step back and I say, well, what can you control? What can you control? You can't control that so-and-so didn't come to work today. You can't control that we didn't get this today. You can't control that this shipment didn't go out last night. You can't control any of that stuff. But what right now, you've got a choice. What can you control? It's the same question that Elisha asked. Is what do you have, and whatever you have, you use it, and you say, God, here it is. And God, I'm trusting you, and I'm trusting that you can move, and I'm trusting that you can do great things. Y'all remember that song, Little as Much When God Is In It? Come on. It doesn't matter. It's all about surrender because your God wants to meet you where you are. If you have a little bit, God is saying you surrender it. But now check this. What do you have in the house? He says, I don't have anything but a jar of oil. Verse 3 says, he said, well, okay, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and not a few. Then he gives him her instructions on what to do when she gets back. This miracle doesn't happen if the neighbors don't give up their pots. Come on, somebody, you see it? Most of us, if I had to just be so bold to step out and say, we're probably not in the place of the widow, but we all are in the place of the neighbor. Come on. I have found myself praying. Brooke and I have found ourselves praying over these last few months. God, show us the excess in our lives so that we can surrender that. And God, we want to use it outside of what we tithe, outside of what we're giving. And God, what in the world do you want us to do with it so we can invest it in the kingdom? And I'm not saying that to say, look at me. I'm saying that some of us have some pots that we're just sitting on. I'm saying that to say that God has blessed us over and abundantly. And let, let me just go ahead and give this full disclosure. This isn't a message about you tithing. This is a message about you obeying your God. This is a message about you stepping into obedience with what God has blessed us with this Thanksgiving season, this holiday season. She had to get the pots from somebody, and God wants to use you and your resources. But if you remember James 1... It's already God's anyway. It's not like it's yours. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. So God has blessed us, and He wants to use you and your resources to impact the world. God has blessed you so that you can bless other people. And we're not talking about just financially. We're talking about financially. We're talking about with your skill set. We're talking about with the, the abilities that you may or may not have. We're talking about maybe, uh, maybe some food that you're just going to throw away. We're talking about this whole thing of excess that God 
God has blessed us with in our lives. But if you begin to think about our culture, it's about hoarding it all up one day so you die. And, but that's not at all what God tells us to do. What God has said, okay, yes, you be wise and you be, you be smart with what I bless you with, but at the same time, you distribute it. At the same time, there's a dying world. There's a world that is hurting. There's a world that is broken. There's a world that is needy. There's a world that needs some help, that needs some hope. And I want you to be a conduit of blessing to that world all around us. Jesus says, store it for yourself treasures in heaven where nothing can corrupt it, where it matters. She begins to go and she knocks on the door and you begin to think about how we've reacted as a church, not just not us, but as church in general in the South. We've said we don't really have pots and what pots we do have we need to hold on to just in case. Bump that. God's not calling us to do that. God's saying, here, surrender everything that you have to me. I got that extra pot. If you need another one, I'll get you one. But right now, you don't need it. It's hoarded up in the back, and there's somebody that needs it. Think about it. This woman misses out on a miracle of God if her neighbors don't give out. So maybe, just maybe, stepping into this call of excess is us providing God an avenue to do a miracle in somebody else's life. You see it? I'm not saying that God wouldn't have still done a God-sized thing. I'm saying God and His sovereignty, for whatever reason, chose this way to do it. Come on. I don't want to miss anything. God, may we never be a church that miss out on your calling and an avenue to be a miracle in a dark world. Come on, somebody. Do you see it? I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss out on God moving, not for my sake, but for the glory of God and His kingdom's sake, that the world may know that there's a God who cares, there's a God who can, and we just need to step into obedience behind that. Come on, somebody, you see it? Where is the excess? Number three, believe in more. Number three, believe in more. Okay, now go in. Once you get back, shut the door behind yourself and your sons, and you start pouring into all these vessels. You just start pouring in these pots. You start filling them up one after one. So she does it. And she shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When she fills up one, move it to the side, bring me another one. Fills it up, move it to the side, fills it up. Over and over and over again, this happens until there's no more vessels, there's no more pots to fill. So when the, all the pots are full, the oil ceases. That's how the story goes. There's not another, then the oil stops flowing. So just check it, right? Most of the time, not all the time, but if you begin to think of how we reason through things, when we're in a desperate place, there may be an avenue out, but we are too scared to pull the trigger. If she still got to go and step into this, she st there's some faith here, but there's also some obedience. Like, and it's not just, God, here, I'm crying out to you, now let me sit here and wait. No, God has told her what to do, and now instead of sitting here and waiting, she's got to step into what God is telling her to do. You see it? As we begin to think about it, the faith grows as you step into God's call in obedience. Our faith begins to manifest itself when we step into what God has called us to. If you begin to think about it, Peter walked on water for a little bit because he said, God or Jesus, is that you? And if it is, call out to me. It is. So Jesus then meets Jesus. Peter then meets Jesus in obedience and steps out on the water. Come on, you see it? That at some point in time, our faith in God must meet obedience to God. And we have spent so long, we pray about it, we'll pray about it until we're blue in the face, but really what we're doing is we say, hopefully one day somebody will be quiet about it because they'll forget about it, because we don't want to step into obedience. Come on, you see it? We serve a God that is bigger than we think He is. We serve a God that is greater than we could ever fathom. Can I ask you this question? How big is God to you? How big is God to you? If you begin to think about it, right? Elisha says, go get some pots and not too few. Get a lot of them. Don't get one, don't get two, get a bunch of them because the measure in which you believe is the measure in which you're going to receive. That's not just me making that up. That's what happens in Scripture. You see it? If she gets one pot, the implication is there's one pot of oil. If she goes and gets 20 pots, the implication is she's going to get 20 pots of oil. If she had 15 more pots after this one, 
The implication is she's going to have 15 more pots of oil. You see it? When she runs out of vessels, that's when the oil stops. Now, I'm not saying that prosperity. I'm saying that's the truth of God. At some point in time, we've got to stop faith in God, and we've got to step into the call of God. Come on. Well, it comes from faith in God, then we follow God, and we watch God do what God's going to do. Come on. Y'all, y'all woke. This is what God is calling us to. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 3. Now to him, Jesus, who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, God's capability and God's limit is set by God. That means there is none. There is no limit to what God can or cannot do. God does not work in our limitations. God works in the resources of heaven. This is what we're stepping into. We just have to make room for God to move. Can I just say God can rebuild your life. God can rebuild or your marriage. God can bring healing to your brokenness. God can protect you from evil. God can turn your mourning to joy. God wants to do God-sized things in your life. Period. That's not something I'm making up. That's not something I'm shooting from the hip. That is a truth in God's Word that God wants to move mountains in your life. God wants to do great things so that the world may know that God is good. The end of John says that Jesus did so much that if I wrote about it, I would fill up every book ever imaginable. Can you imagine what that extra is that we don't even know that God did? God wants to do that in our lives. He's just asking us to step into it. I'm going to take a breath. Believe in more. Are we a people that just sit back in our lives and begin to worry about all that stuff? And I'm not saying that's not a real thing. That's a real thing. That's a real struggle for some of us, especially in this world. But God can do whatever He wants to do. The psalmist writes that our God is in the heavens and He does whatever He pleases. That means God ain't got no boss. He can do whatever He wants to do. The cool thing about God is whatever He wants to do has always been good. It's always been for the betterment of His people. He has always been working, intricately waving and weaving everything together for His purposes and for His glory. Believe in more. Number four, be wise when God moves. Number four, be wise when God moves. After she gets all the pots filled up, the oil stops flowing, and she goes and she tells a lot, oh, you can't, won't believe what just happened. Really? Right? She goes and she tells Elisha what happened and told the man of God. And he said, okay, now go sell the oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on the rest. She is in debt, right? That's how the story begins. She is in financial debt. So now God has made a way for her to get out of that and be free from that. But notice Elisha strictly says, look, you're in debt. God didn't give you all this oil so you can be able to eat now. No, you go be wise with the blessing. You sell it all and you get out of debt. And you live on the rest. And the rest is enough. How many of us would say, oh, I got me a new car? That's what our culture teaches. And I'm not saying that that's how we live. I'm saying that's the battle we face. That's the culture we live in is that when things move, when things happen and things come together, we still choose to stay in chains. We still choose to stay in bondage. Think outside of finances for just a second. Think about addiction. Think about shame. Think about uh, abusive relationships. Think about all of that stuff. When God gives an avenue out, don't be stupid and stay in it. I just said it. Don't be foolish. That's a truth found in God's Word. That if I'm providing for you, step into what I'm doing. Be wise with my blessing and get out of bondage. Get out. I want to free you. God desires freedom for His children. That's free from debt. That's free from worry. That's free from anxiety. That's free from doubt. That's free from all of that stuff. This, this applies financially, but this applies to us spiritually as well. God wants you to step into the freedom that He's offering and be free. That's it. When Jesus came back from the dead, He broke every chain. He broke every curse, and He offers that freedom. It's not like we're on probation from sin and we've got our ankle bracelet around. No, He has freed us completely from everything that we struggle with. So be wise. Because He wants you to be free. 
So can I just ask you, this holiday season, as we begin to reflect on how to be thankful, are we wise when God moves? You know, I'll reflect back in my life, and I begin to pray for things, and I begin to pray for breakthrough, and I begin to pray that everything falls into place. And when it does, I never check up. Why? God did what I asked him to. I'm just too blinded to see it. I began to think about when we were getting ready to graduate and approaching marriage and quickly with neither one of us having jobs, we began to pray, God, where do you want us? God, where do you have us? Get a job offer from where I'm at now. If we go there, now you got to find a job, girl. So she goes, and before she gets out of the parking lot of the career fair, she's got like five or six drive offers on the table all within the same area. And I begin to think about that, and I, I'm thinking about that right now, and I'm back over that, and I'm like, God, you've been so faithful to us. I'm about to cry. I don't really know why. But you guys just been so faithful, and I wonder how often in our times God begins to do things like that. And because we're so fast food centered, and because we have so much access, I wonder if we even think it's God. It's just everything falling in the place. We won't say we believe in karma, but our lives reflect it. We'll say that we don't believe in ourselves and we trust God, but our lives reflect that I built it all. That I've, I've kind of got it all up. And I'm not saying that's the lifestyle that you live, so don't hear me say that. But what I'm saying is, be careful. Be careful, because everything that you have, it ain't yours. It is your heavenly Father's that has been given to you, blessed you so that you can take care of you, so that you can have what you need, because his eye is on the sparrow. He makes sure the birds are fed. He's going to make sure you got something to eat, too. But at the same time, he wants to take care of his creation, mankind, God's heart is this, to care for the orphans and the widows. James says that. What are we doing with the excess in our lives? And I'm not just saying that, oh, well, I've got a little extra over here. Let me find something to do with it. No, I'm talking about like, God, you've blessed me with this. And I'm choosing to meet you in obedience and faith, you. Faith that you can take my little bit and make it much. And God, I'm going to follow you in obedience. And God, I'm going to watch you move. To God be the glory. So can I ask you to ask this question to God? God, show me my excess. God, show me my excess. And God, may we be obedient with it. Can I ask you, are you thankful? A thankful person is normally a happy person. It's not just a this time of the year thing. It's a because you serve a God who can. There ain't nothing that this world can do to me. Because I serve a God who can do far more than I could ask or think. I serve a God who can keep his end of the deal. I serve a God who's never broken one of his promises and he ain't going to start today. I serve a God who is a lighthouse in darkness. I serve a God who specializes in healing. I serve a God who specializes in restoration. I serve a God of miracles and I serve a God who can move mountains. That's the God I serve. God, thank you, thank you, thank you, God. We're thankful for our stuff, but are we thankful to God? For to God be the glory for all the things that he's done. Are we thankful? Are we thankful? I begin to think about yesterday. Brooke goes and checks the mail, and she sets it down on the table, and I was walking back through the house, and I saw it, and there was this, this envelope that had been marked all over with with a marker, and it said, must read. This little girl, I ain't got a clue who she is, and I may not ever meet her, but this little girl took it upon herself that she was going to write letters and go around and put them in people's mailboxes. And this little letter based on whatever it said, she said, this world's full of hate. I just wanted to give some hope. I don't know if they know Jesus. I don't know if her family knows you. I don't know her. I pray they do. All I know is she saw that there was a need and she wanted to do something about it. 
It wasn't monetary. She didn't spell half anything right. It, so it wasn't perfect. But she saw a need and she met it. Her excess was her time. Her excess was she had some markers. And there was a need and she met it. Because she knew that the world needs a little hope. Come on. God's not asking you to write a $10,000 check. If you want to do that, come on. God's not asking you to go above and beyond. God's just saying, let me do that. And watch me change the world. Because you're surrendering it all to me. Come on, you see it? It doesn't have to be right. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to have everything together. Her spelling was wrong. It was in different colors. It was all over the page. Who cares? It made a difference. It made a difference in my life. And she don't even know me. That somebody sees. A little girl even knows the world's jacked up and needs some hope. We begin to think about it. Are we thankful? Where's the excess? What are we doing to serve God? Here we are, your people. Because God, we believe that you can. So can I ask you today as we close and you begin to go and go home and maybe you don't, you're off this week, maybe you're out of school this week, maybe you're off Thursday and you're running around and God is calling you to a life of thankfulness and God is calling you to step into a God who can. And God is calling you to faith Him and God is calling you to follow Him. Maybe you do find yourself in that desperate place and maybe at some point in time you found yourself in that desperate place. Can I just say, what do you have? And whatever you have, can I just say, give it to God. It's not like just superficial faith thing that we say. No, this is a good, good father that's just wanting you to ask you. Maybe you find yourself in the neighbor's shoes. The way I see it, you're either in one of two places in the story. You're either in the shoes of the widow or you're in the shoes of the neighbor. And can I ask you to pray? I've already asked you, but can I seriously challenge you to pray? God, show us where we can be generous. Not to, not to Rocky Point, but to the world around you. The world wants to see something real and intentional. The world wants to see something that is outward seeking, that sees the need and does something about it. And we're just saying, God, here is where you've blessed me. Now, God, we want to be a conduit of blessing to hurt. God, show us where that is. And God, I just pray that you use it that you would just move and that, God, you would do great things. So can we pray that across this room? Can we pray that as we get ready to, to run around, that we just pause for just these next few seconds and say, God, thank you. Can we just say thank you, God, for, for my family? Thank you, God, for my kids. God, thank you, God, for the resources that you blessed me with. God, thank you for this faith family. And we just thank God in this moment. God, in the middle of a chaotic world, I pray that we're thankful. If you're in this place today, and maybe you're in the shoes of the widow, can I just say, do what the widow did, and you just cry out. God, I don't know where else to turn. I don't know where else to go. I don't know what else to do. I don't know where, what, but God, I, I need you to move. Maybe we're in the boat of the neighbor. Can I just ask you to pray, God, where's the excess? But can I just challenge you with this? Don't faith God if you're not planning on following him. Come on, and God's going to show us, and God's going to show us what to do. God's going to show us what to step into. Can I just ask you to just meet Him there? That we meet Him in obedience. So God, right now as we close, God, I'm thankful. God, I pray that you'd forgive me of where I'm ungrateful. God, I pray that you'd forgive me of where I just flat out miss you move. I pray that you'd forgive me of where I've prayed and you've answered and God, I don't ever rejoice in it. 
God, I thank you for this faith family. God, I thank you for what they mean to me. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for how you've blessed us and how you use us. And God, I just pray that our hearts would be thankful. God, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for offering a way. God, I pray that you would meet us. That you would meet us here today, God, as, as we reflect on all the things that we have to be thankful for. God, as we've sung, thank you, Lord. As we've sung how great you are, God, may those two intersect. And God, may we just step into a God of more. May we step into that you are a God who can. God, that we step into that you can change. And God, you can turn things around. God, that you are faithful. You are faithful to move. God, give us wisdom, God, that when you offer an avenue out, that, God, we step into it. That, God, we step into it, and, God, may we watch you do God-sized things. God, I pray with everything in me that you do God-sized things in this house not for this house's sake, God, not for my sake, but God, for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we be a people that are faithful with the excess. May we be a people fully surrendered to you and open to whatever that is. God, may we be a people that are eager to meet you in obedience. God, as we respond, I pray that you would move and that you would speak in the lives of your people. And it's in your name alone we pray. God, I love you.